Leticia to join us. Um, and I will start introducing Leticia. So first, I would like to thank uh, Leticia Aviles, our speaker, because she took the time to be with us today despite a very busy schedule. I think she's already committed to another conference. So I'm delighted that she's taking the time to come here with us despite having uh, this busy week. So Leticia obtained her PhD at Harvard University and held a first faculty position at the University of Arizona in the US. She's currently a professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada, where she teaches undergraduate courses on Darwinian medicine, animal behavior, and methods of feed ecology. One of her long-term goals is to elucidate the forces involved in the transition between levels of organization, in particular between individuals and social groups. Her main model of study are spiders, and to develop a study, she and the research team employ biorecial research tools, including seed work in temperate and tropical areas, computer simulation, analytical modeling, and work employing behavioral and molecular techniques. Her talk will be on habitat filtering and lipid gene similarity, the ecology of spider sociality. So nice to meet you, Leticia. The virtual floor is yours, and you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Well, uh, good morning over here, good evening somewhere else, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here, and especially congratulations for this such a wonderful initiative to have created this seminar series, and it's a real honor to be here. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, and hopefully everything will work out. <laughs> okay. Um, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong one. I need to do a different one. Um, is that okay? Now there's the presentation is visible there. Yeah, I think it works. It might be. It, it is. It is your side of the presentation, so you have the time and stuff. But we do see the slides, so if it's worth okay. oh, Can you see the other slides, not just the one that I'm presenting? No, no, I see only the slides. So I think you're oh, okay. good to go. Okay. Is that better? Like I kind of put it in. It is. It okay. is perfect. Perfect now. Excellent. Okay. All right. So. Hello, everybody, everywhere, wherever you are, and thank you so much for being here. I'm really happy to be talking to you about um, some work that is dear to my heart uh, on the ecology of spider sociality. I'm generally interested in the evolution of social behavior, and I was fortunate that when I was an undergraduate in Ecuador, actually, it's where I am from, and I did my undergraduate degree, I discovered social spiders, and I um, started to working working with these organisms back then. And I have used this system over the years to cover a variety of questions in the fields of ecology and evolution. And initially, uh, I was actually dealing more with questions with these spiders have highly female bias sex ratios. And so that was the kind of work that I was doing then. Why do bias sex ratios evolve? Which led me to questions having to do with levels of selection, inbreeding, which is also a topic that is relevant for the spiders. And eventually I landed on the question of why they are social, which led me to uh, addressing the ecological factors that shape uh, social behavior in these organisms. But I would say in general, ecology is what is shaping um, the, 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 the behavior and the morphology of organisms. And today, so I will, um, the message that I will give you, because this is an animal behavior conference, I will show you how animal behavior can play an important role in determining the composition of animal communities. And in doing so, you saw in my title, uh, these sort of terms from community ecology, I will be combining concepts of community ecology with the study of animal behavior and specifically the study of animal social behavior. And so the social spiders, which are the organisms that I work with, I will first uh, give you an, an introduction to 
what the social spiders are. They are not many species, so many people may not have even heard that they exist. And then I will sort of give you a brief introduction to this concept of community ecology, and then start addressing some of the questions on the bio of the biology of social spiders that we can address by using this concept of community ecology. So as you know, most spiders are solitary. Uh, so here's the small web of a solitary spider. Uh, but in some species in different spider genera and different families, they have evolved this type of behavior that's known as subsocial. So here, what happens is that the offspring in spiders, they typically close from an egg sac and they may remain together for a few days, but they disperse. But in this species, instead of dispersing, they remain together for a few weeks, even a few months, often in the presence of the mother. And uh, these colonies then contain about dozens of individuals, but the spiders disperse before they reach reproductive maturity. But in a few species, less than a couple of dozen species, instead of dispersing, the offspring remain together within the natal nest and they mate with each other to produce a new generation that expands the web. And in some species, in some areas, this may, may lead to the formation of colonies with hundreds of individuals, which now it consists of multiple mothers and their offspring, so multiple families sharing a communal web. And in some of the areas, in some of the species, these colonies may grow to contain thousands to tens of thousands of spiders, as this really large web that I photographed a long time ago in the rainforests of Ecuador. And by the way, if you are interested in sort of further concepts on uh, just sort of a brief overview of spider sociality, here's a recent reference that is kind of a short summary on the topics of spider sociality. So one of the things that I actually find exciting about the social spiders is the ways in which they are different from other social organisms. They are different from what we refer to as used social insects, like bees or wasps or termites or ants, in that the, the social spiders form very egalitarian societies, individuals uh, there is no uh, reproductive division of labor within the colonies. There are no castes. So everybody's more or less the same, even though they do compete with each other, but they, it's not like a caste system with a hierarchy or um, non-reproductive individuals in the colonies. And the other way in which they're different from the vast majority of social organisms and actually from the vast majority of organisms is that they remain together in the species that have formed these multi-generational colonies with multiple families. They remain together um, after they uh, mature, they mate with each other within the colonies, and this can happen generation after generation. So as a result of these, the, the, the spider colonies and the spiders are highly inbred. And one consequence of this has been the evolution of, of female bias sex ratios which is what I used to study uh, originally when I uh, started the, my work on these spiders when I was an undergraduate actually, and also was part of my work um, for my PhD. So the, the spiders remain within the natal colonies, they mate and then they produce new generations. And so these may result in colonies, here's relatively small colonies to grow over a few of several generations to contain, to form this really large net that I showed you before. And so the social spider colonies are not only social groups, but they are also populations and they can also be used as models to study population phenomena. As we can actually record and observe their growth. We can observe colonies dispersing and we can also see colonies going extinct. So some of the other work that I have done that I will not have time to to talk about today has to do with studying dispersal and extinction and also the consequences of inbreeding. These spiders are phylogenetically diverse. So here, uh, the phylogenetic tree of spiders showing uh, the numbers around the, uh, the tree are the number of independent origins of uh, this form of a spider sociality. And it turns out that almost every independent origin resulted in a, in, a, in a single species. So many origins, but not that many species overall. So we have sort of described and studied about 19 species belonging to eight genera and five spider families. Despite this phylogenetic diversity, they have converged in this sort of 
very similar population structure that I dis just described and in very similar social behaviors. So they all share some communal web. Typically, it's sort of like a, any regular type of structure as the one seen in this picture. And the spiders uh, participate in uh, maintaining, building and maintaining the web, the colony members. They also uh, cooperate in capturing the prey and this allows them to capture uh, insects that may be many times the size of the individual spiders. They also share their food and they have communal brood care. And in this picture, I'm showing you a representation of the species in different genera and different families. So the, these two to the left <laughs> or right, uh, uh, I don't know, can you see my cursor there? Um, we can, we can. Okay, good. So those two belong to uh, the genus Anelosimus in the family Theridide. Here in the corner to the right, my right, we see uh, another species in the uh, same family, but a different genus, Theridion. These bright yellow spiders that are really beautiful are in the family Dictinidae, different family. All of these that I mentioned so far occur in are neotropical, and I they occur in Ecuador where I have worked with them. And then this last one here is a female that is feeding some spiderlings by regurgitation, belongs to the genus Stegodiphos, which is an old world genus. And I was fortunate that I had some colonies of these uh, species in this genus in my lab for a while. So as I mentioned before, the colonies grow to these really large sizes. And then there is a point at which they, they, they undergo a dispersal event and produce daughter colonies. So in some species, this may involve the production of many small daughter colonies as the ones shown in this picture. Or in other species, and this is actually that bright yellow spider that I showed you before, the colonies reproduce by fission. And the other important aspect of these organisms is that they all have a tropical distribution, which is going to be important to addressing the question of why they are social and why they are with, with, where they occur. So here we have the five, the five families that have produced social species and the dots here show the places around the world where they are located. Within the tropics, and this is now looking at species in the genus Anelosimus, which contains seven social species, they also have a, a very distinct distrib a geographical distribution. The social species, the red dots here, are located in as I said before, in tropical areas, so in the tropics, and also within the tropics, they are found in the lowlands, and in this case, the lowland tropical rainforest. And as you can see, they are absent from higher elevations, the Andes here, and they are absent from higher latitudes. So that's the social species, the ones that make these big webs. The other ones, the ones that form single family units, on the other hand, are absent from the lowland tropical rainforest, and they occur at higher elevations and higher latitudes. So we will come back to the question of why this may be. The other pattern that we observe um, when we're working with these spiders and is that if you go to any location where there is more than one species in this genus Anelosimus, you will notice that they seem to be different from each other, either like in this case, uh, in, um, is a place where there is, there is only social species, but they are very different in, in size. There are other places, on the other hand, where you have all the social systems represented. And it seems that they are not two species alike within these local communities. So we can ask ourselves, based on this geographical distribution, what explains the, the distinct geographical distribution of spider social systems, and in this case uh, of the genus Anelosimus, and whether these species in local communities are more dissimilar than expected by chance. So I will get back to what we mean with these more dissimilar than expected by chance. But to do this, I will sort of now uh, review some of the concepts of community ecology that I mentioned and some of the terms that were part of the title of my presentation. So an environmental filter and niche partitioning and limiting similarity. And basically these are concepts of community ecology and community ecology 
uh, is interested in tr trying to understand what determines the composition of plant and animal communities. And one of the first factors that is going to determine what organisms are present in an area is going to be the abiotic factors, such as in this case, we see um, a environmental gradient from dry to, to wet. And we see two species here, the blue species that's poorly in the dry environment, but that's wet in, well in the wet environment, whereas the other species, the one in orange here, does well in the dry environment, but poorly in the wet environment. So the environmental filter in interaction with whatever characteristics these species have would sort of select the ones that can be in any one particular place. But after that, the other factor that comes into play is how the different species in a community interact with each other. And we're going to think specifically about the species that belong to the same genus or, you know, they're phylogenetically close. Uh, and, in, and so the issue here is that if they are too similar, they would be occupying the same ecological niche. And they would, one of the two would have to either leave, be excluded, go extinct. So this is what would need to, or, or would evolve to be different from the other species. So this would lead to what we refer to as niche partitioning. So they spread themselves in niche space so that they don't overlap in their use of resources. And when we have a situation like this, we refer to this as limiting similarity. So the species are sufficiently different from each other that they kind of don't get in each other's ways in terms of the use of resources. So we'll start with the first issue of the environmental filter, uh, which basically addressing what explains the geographical distribution of the spiders, in this case, in the genus Anelosimus, is basically asking the question of what environmental filters determine what species occur where. And as I said before, the environmental filter is going to work as a result of an interaction between factors in the environment with specific features of the organisms. And I, I, we have sort of proposed, and we are in the process of studying this, um, and we have already been studying for many years, that the reason why um, these species seem to have that particular geographical distribution is because they all belong, they belong to genera that build these dense three-dimensional webs. So here, is the web of one of the species in the genus Anelosimus. And here, just to show you that these dense three-dimensional webs with a lot of silk are a characteristic of social spiders in all the genera that we have looked at or that we know of. And the idea here is that unlike the ore webs, which are designed to be built by a single individual, these irregular two-dimensional webs are shareable. Also because of the very high silk content, they are valuable resources, so they would be costly to replace and maintain. Also, given their geometry, they probably pro provide better protection from predation than, you know, other, like the ore webs, for instance, would provide. And also the larger the webs, the better for the spiders. And they should also be subject to a scaling loss of three-dimensional objects. And so here, just to show you when we, we talk about these webs are costly, uh, at least in terms of the amount of silk that they contain, the webs like the ones that the social spiders build, which are more of this type of sheet and tangle webs here, uh, we are looking here at the web contact per unit mass of the spider as a function of the mass of the individual or the mass of the colony. And the reason why I'm refer I have either individual or colony mass is because there are some solitary and some social spiders represented in this figure. So the ones with these uh, green triangles are ore webs. And we have a few species with tangle webs, which are three-dimensional also, but that don't have as much silk as we show here as these sheet and tangle webs. And so here showing just the comparison for spiders of the same size, uh, the webs uh, of the sheet and tangle nature contain orders of magnitude more silk. And so this is a log scale here for the web content. 
And very interestingly here, we have the solitary spiders here and in this, with the same line, with the same regression, uh, with the same slope, we have here group living spiders. And this is um, group living in this case, these are species in the genus Anolosimus, which build seed and tangle webs. So we can see three things here, or, uh, you know, these seed and tangle webs contain a lot more silk. Uh, all these species seem to show some sort of economy of a scale. So the bigger the individual, the bigger the colony, the smaller the web. And that's probably because metabolically, as organisms grow, their metabolic requirements per unit mass decrease with the size of the, uh, it decreases as the, as the size of the individual gets bigger. And we also see how the group living allows these spiders to extend the range of mass of organisms contained in these webs above and beyond that of the solitary spiders. And again, here we have a log scale for um, the x-axis. And so that would be the organismal side. How about the environmental factors? So I already showed you that these spiders have a tropical distribution and that within the tropics, the species in the genus Anelosimus uh, have this sort of very, uh, peculiar distribution. And so I sort of more or less describe what's going on here. So I would just now to, like to emphasize the questions that we sort of have to address to understand this uh, geographical distribution. And we see here, um, the first question is why the subsocial species, the ones that form the single family units, why are they absent from these lowland tropical rainforest areas? And the other question, is why are the social species, the red dots, on the other hand, absent from these higher elevations and higher latitudes, where on the other hand, the subsocial species is present? So we are going to address these two questions. And in addressing these questions, we are going to identify the environmental filters that may be responsible for this uh, geographical distribution. And also at the same time, they, we will answer the question of why they are social and, and where they are social. So why are subsocial species, the blue dots, absent from the lowland tropical rainforest? And what we have suggested is that this is because they build these costly, valuable webs that are hard to replace because they contain a lot of silk in areas where it rains very hard and where predation rate is high. And we, over the years, uh, looked at these environmental factors in the environment, and we have been able to measure uh, that predation rate. So here, a lower elevation to the left of this figure. And so that would be the tropical rainforest and higher elevation to the right. We see that predation rate is significantly higher, and this is predation rate on arthropods at the lower elevations in the tropical rainforest. And we also see that the precipitation rate. So that's how much it rains during a period of time. So how hard it rains, which should be relevant in terms of damage in the webs. Precipitation rate is highest also in the area where the lowland rainforest is present. So the idea is that this combination of strong rains and high predation rate would exclude the solitary and subsocial Anelosimus species from the lowland tropical rainforest. And so let me sort of show you some evidence, uh, some experimental work that we have done with the students in my lab that test the hypothesis that strong rains and predation exclude the solitary subsocial anelosimus from the lowland tropical rainforest. And by the way, I have been including uh, photographs of the students that have been working, that have worked with me in this project. So to give credit to all of them and the reference of the papers published are here at the bottom of the screen. So we have tested these predation precipitation hypotheses and we did this by transplanting. So in the lowland rainforest, we don't have a subsocial anelosimus species. They are present at higher elevation. So what we did is we took a, nests of these single female colonies to the lowland uh, rainforest. 
And we also, as a control for the experiment, we did the same manipulation, transplanted them within the native habitat. And the idea was to transplant them to the, low, the lowland rainforest and sort of try to understand why is it that they don't naturally occur there. And to do this, because our hypothesis is that it is, this is because of rain and predators, then we subjected the uh, transplanted uh, colonies in both of these places to four treatments. So one of the treatments consisted of eliminating predators and rain, very sophisticated methods. We just cover the, the, the webs with the tarp, uh, just kidding about the sophisticated. And uh, we also put a disc at the bottom of the plant that contained the spiders uh, to sort of prevent crawling predators from getting up into the webs. Um, so some treatments excluded both rain and predators. Uh, another group who excluded only predators, excluded only rain, or left the colonies untreated. No protection from these things. And so what happened? And here we see the survival probability of these colonies over time, uh, about, for about a month. And we see that at the local site, I saw the original mid elevation where they naturally occur, they did pretty well. You know, there was a little bit of mortality, but not much, but especially there was no difference between the treatments. And what this suggests basically is that neither rain nor predators are a problem in that area, which would explain why they happily live there. Whereas in the lowland rainforest where they don't occur, they went extinct, these colonies very quickly when they were unprotected, but they did better when they were protected. So there was significantly better survival for those nests that were protected from the rain and predators, which sort of demonstrates that there is a causal relationship between them going extinct and rain and predators. Obviously there are other things because they still didn't do as well as in the native habitat, but we still show that we can improve the survival of these colonies by protecting them from the rain and from predators. And what we found, because if we go in the same genus in these lowland tropical rainforest areas, we do have uh, all the social species. So here I'm showing the photographs of two social, these are the ones that form the large webs. They do form occasionally colonies that contain a single female or a few females. So we have been able to reconstruct the fitness of those females as a function of colony size and for these two species. And we see here that if we look near the origin, so we see that they do best at colonies of intermediate size. But what I like to emphasize now is that the ones that are in very small colonies, they actually are below this sort of dotted line here, which is basically the replacement line. That would be when one female produce one surviving adult female in the offspring generation. And so the ones that are in groups succeed at producing surviving offspring, but those that are in these very small colonies or single female colonies don't. So, and this was in a way a surprise to us because when we think about why organisms are social, we typically think, you know, they are social because they are better off in groups than they are by themselves because there are costs eventually this fitness function. So they better off as in groups means that they have fit, higher fitness at some size, colony size larger than one or a few individuals. And then eventually these curves go down because they're also cost on being in groups. But originally when thinking about social spiders, I thought they, you know, you have a situation where a species could be very well occur in this particular habitat. It's above this replacement line here, but it could access an ecological opportunity by being in groups and cooperating. And originally I had thought, well, that's what the social spiders are there because they are these big insects in the rainforest that solitary spiders cannot capture. So they have become social to access this empty ecological niche. But as it turns out, and this is what happens in the figure at the bottom here, this, in this case, it's a function where it shows that by being in groups, they actually are able to colonize an area where they wouldn't be able to persist if they live as solitary individuals. And it turns out that the reason why they are social 
is not to access this big uh, uh, resource, but rather because if they weren't in a group, they couldn't be there. So as I say, this was sort of a surprise. But I'm going to show you next that insects do matter, but it I will tell you in a bit how that works. But to begin with, intense ra rains and high predation sort of exclude these non-social species in these genera with dense webs from the lowland tropical rainforest. And so a reason to be there is in a order to help each other maintain the web and protect the upstream from predators. So that was the one pattern. So why these so subsocial species, the blue dots here, are not found in the lowland tropical rainforest. But the other pattern here is why the social species are absent from higher elevations and higher latitudes. And here is where the insects come into place and the size of the insects in particular. So what we have found, and for, to do this, we sampled insects in the environments where the social and the sol subsocial species live so along this sort of elevational gradient on the Andes. And what we found is that there is a difference in the size of the insects that are found in different areas. So here, it, this graph in green is showing how um, at the low elevation, this is a lowland tropical rainforest, there is plenty of these very large insects. So we have here a log scale for insect mass. So we see that very large insects are present there. But if we go to higher elevation, this is a site at 2,000 meters um, on the Andes. These large insect size classes are missing. And we see here, uh, again, as a function of elevation, the size of the insects on a log scale. Actually, no, yes, a log scale there. We see also that we have the larger insects at the lower elevations and then the insects get smaller as you go up in elevation. And we are showing here diurnal, diurnal and nocturnal insects. And the reason for this, I would like to suggest, is because of three dimension. Yeah, okay, so the, not the reason why the insects are there, but the reason why the social spiders are absent from higher elevations and latitudes is because of absence of large insects in those areas. So I'm gonna show you next why that would be the case. And here's where this three-dimensional scaling uh, of these objects comes into play. So uh, three-dimensional objects as the growing size without a change in shape, the surface doesn't grow as fast as the volume. As an, a, a result of that, we have surface area per, per volume ratio. We expect it to be a declining function of the volume. So that's shown on the figure here. And it turns out that the insects that the spiders receive as food for their colonies are intercepted by the surface of the, their webs. So the number of insects that enter the colony should be proportional to the surface of the webs. But the spiders that need to feed on those insects, their number and their biomass is proportional to the volume of the, the, the web. And because of this three-dimensional scaling, and this relationship between insects coming proportional to the surface, spiders proportional to the volume, we would expect that the number of prey per capita should be a decreasing function of colony size. So we could test this hypothesis, or this prediction, looking at spiders. In this case, we're looking at spiders, both um, a species in the lowland tropical rainforest, social, very large colony sizes. So here I have a log scale for colony size also. And here we have on the x-axis, the number of insects per capita also on a log scale. And here we have a species, a subsocial species, the one with a single family unit at a higher elevation location. And we see here that in both cases, they are getting fewer insects per capita as the colonies grow in size, which sort of kind of begs the question, uh, looking at the social species is why are they living in groups if they are getting fewer insects per capita? Well, it turns out that if they are in an area where there are large insects in the environment, they are in these colonies, they cooperate to capture these bigger insects. And the bigger the colony, the more spiders, the bigger the insects that they can capture. So the um, size of the insects that they capture increases with the size of the colony. 
So we have fewer insects per capita, but bigger insects as colonies are bigger. And the product of those two results in biomass per capita peaking at some intermediate colony size, which would explain first why it makes sense for them to be in groups in this habitat. It would also explain why eventually very large colonies will disperse and leave because eventually um, they sort of the surface to volume ratio basically it will catch up and they will not be able to get sufficient food and so the colonies must disperse. But this happens much sooner at the higher elevation because these large insect size classes are missing. So even if the spiders try, there are no big insects to capture cooperatively. And as a result of that biomass, that biomass per capita decreases with colony size. And again, remind you here the law of scale here. That would explain why at the higher elevation, the subsocial spiders form colonies that contain the single families and then they disperse before producing a new generation. Whereas in the lowland rainforest, they can produce colonies with hundreds of thousands of individuals. So as it turned out, large insects did make a, a difference. So accessing large prey turned out to be important and actually in fact necessary, a necessary benefit of group living. But it is secondary to the reason why they are there originally is because if they weren't in a group, they couldn't occupy that habitat given the types of webs that they built. So to summarize basically what are these environmental filters of the spider sociality uh, that I am arguing explain their geographical distribution uh, what I have sort of shown you is that given that they have these costly three-dimensional webs and there is this gradient of uh, insect size, rain intensity, and predation uh, as you go towards the tropical rainforest here, we see that the subsocial spiders, in this case, this orange line, are doing well in areas where there is no rain is soft, the uh, no high predation insects are sufficient for single individuals, but they do poorly where rain and predation is strong. Whereas the social spiders, the ones that build the big webs, have the opposite pattern. They are absent from these higher elevations where insects are small, but they do well. Uh, they are able to repair the webs and maintain the colonies in areas where there is strong rain and predation. And they are able to do so because there are large insects that allow them to grow large colonies. So we have put together all these factors because it would be nice to, you know, we did some experiments protecting the webs from um, rain and, and predators, but there's only so much you can do sometimes with the actual system in the field. So what we have done with some collaborators uh, from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, we developed a computer model, a spatial model of spider sociality, where we created a grid here uh, with a range of environments mimicking and using, using actually parameters from the actual data that we have from the spiders ranging from areas at high elevation with small insects, low predation, low, soft rains, to areas in the lower and rainforest with strong rain predation and large insects. And what we see here, we sort of then see this uh, landscape with um, uh, in, is, is, is spiders, is, or it could be anything that depend on these factors. And the subsocial ones are shown in purple here. And the social one from those that produce very small colonies to very a large colonies shown here from sort of this emerald green to blue. And we see here that we have recreated the geographical distribution of social spiders by simulating this environment with these two environmental gradients, insect size on the one hand and disturbance from rain and predation on the other. And we can do some experiments in the computer that we may not be able to do in the field. So we do a, an experiment where we take away large insects from the entire landscape. And we see here that the social species with the large colonies disappear from the, the grid. Or we do an experiment where we eliminate, we make so that there's a strong rain and predation everywhere. And that eliminates from this landscape, the subsocial spider. 
So this as a further test of what we refer to as the prey size and the disturbance hypothesis. So that was the environmental filter. So the first side of these sort of community ecology uh, question. The second one has to do with uh, what explains the sort of this apparent dissimilarity of the species that shares the same location, that live in the same environment, and the question whether they exhibit niche partitioning and limiting similarity. So a little bit of a review here. A niche theory, uh, basically, uh, and these concepts of niche partitioning, the idea here is that species that are similar, typically belonging to the same genus, the, if they they sort of you you have a collection of species in a given location that use space and resources in different ways, so that they are not competing directly with each other. And so there are several examples of these in different animal systems. And typically, people have focused on body size and morphology as traits that would separate a species in niche space. But uh, what I would like to show you today is that differences in group size and level of sociality may also lead to differential resource use and therefore play a role in community assembly. So other organisms here, potentially wolves and ants and all kinds of social systems, when you have multiple species of related uh, belonging to the same genus, it's likely that level of sociality may be a way that they differentiate themselves in their use of resources. So let's go back to this figure for early, from earlier where we saw these five different communities and we saw that they seem to contain species that are different either in their level of sociality, body size or both. And we're gonna ask two questions. So are these differences in body size and level of sociality associated with differential resource use? And are species within these communities more dissimilar than expected by chance? And so this, basically this addressing these questions would be tests of niche partitioning and limiting similarity. And so let's now start with this um, community here at the bottom, which is actually a community in Serra do Japi, Brazil where I worked in collaboration with Brazilian investigators. And it, this is a fabulous place. There are, as I showed you here, there is actually five different species here. I'm showing you here in the figure in these photographs, four of those. So there's a solitary species. The, the spiders disperse right after closing from the exact. There are two subsocial species slightly different from each other. There is a species that is really interesting because it's intermediate between social and subsocial. And then there is a fully social species. And I will also show you how these two species are different. And the question is whether these differences, so we see very these differences in, in the size of the webs and the number of individuals in the web. So a single individual here, a family here, a few dozen to a few hundred here. Actually, yeah, these two actually don't have that much big difference in number of individual to I'll show you some other differences they exhibit. So, but are these differences associated with differential resource use? And so we looked first at their use of space and we are, I'm showing you here how the three less social species, the two subsocial and the solitary one, they tend to be more likely to form their webs at the forest edge whereas the social ones, the intermediate social and social closer to in the forest interior. So they also differentiate themselves at the height at which they build their webs. So within the forest edge, three different heights, in the forest interior, two different heights. And if that wasn't enough, they also differentiate themselves in the position at which they build the web on the branch, on the, on the, on the plants. So some build it in the core of the plant, the middle of mid branch or at the tip. And the same happens both for the ones at the forest edge, the less social ones, and the ones in the forest interior, the more social ones. So they are fully spaced out in their use of space, which was amazing to discover. They're also separated in their use of space and of time. And in this case, we're looking at the two social species and the less social one here and the more social one here. And the main point here is that they 
have the they they are actually seasonal in this area, and the period of reproduction when they are producing eggs is offset. They ha it happens at slightly different times of the year, but during the time when the, the summer, spring, summer, when the resources are plentiful, but still they manage to split that time so that they are not doing the same thing at the same time. And even more amazingly, they have a huge difference in their prey size use. So we have here the solitary species, one of the subsocial, the intermediate one, and the fully social one. And we see here, and uh, we have, it's in a log scale here. No, no, it's not a log scale. Um, we see here that they are kind of like a ladder. The solitary one captures the smallest insects, sub, uh, social slightly bigger, and the intermediate and the social one, the bigger insects. And the social species is capturing bigger insects than the intermediate social subsocial, even though their webs are actually not terribly different in size. But the, there is one aspect that we discover is different between these species and are also between these two here, is that one of them is less cooperative and the other one is more cooperative. So we can see this in the next slide. So we are seeing here um, colony size on the x-axis and insect size on the y-axis. And we see here that the more cooperative species, they are capturing increasingly larger insects as the colonies grow bigger, whereas the less cooperative spiders, the spiders sort of tend to be more individualistic and they don't really help each other that, that much capturing prey. There is a flat relationship between colony size and number of insects and, and the size of the insects that they capture. And something similar happens between the solitary and the subsocial spider. So not only that they differentiate themselves in terms of the size of the webs, but also their behavior, which allows them to again, produce this sort of beautiful separation in the size of the prey that they're capturing. So we have evidence that the, these differences are associated with the differential resource use as a function of level of sociality. What about body size? So to look at this, we go to this community in Ecuador, Hatun Sacha, um, in the lowland rainforest, where there are three social species. And they are of three different sizes. And we're going to be looking at the two, the intermediate and the largest ones. And they both occur in the same areas of the forest. We see here a nest of the larger species, and then a nest of the smaller species not too far from the other one. And more or less, these photos show the size difference between the two. And we look at the insects that they are capturing. And here's the distribution of insect sizes in millimeters. And we see that the little spider is capturing the smaller insects. And then the lar larger spider is capturing some small insects that mostly is capturing large ones. So in this case, we refer to the small species as having an included niche, which would seem a bit problematic because it maybe would, wouldn't do so well when there is another species that is using the same insect size range. But it turns out that the smaller species is more efficient at capturing these smaller insects. So that allows it to sort of man maintain its ground uh, using these smaller resources in this habitat. So yes, there are differences in resource use as a function of level of sociality and body size. And the final question is whether the way in which these communities are assembled relative to body size and level of sociality is more dissimilar than expected by chance. So we but looked at five enough. different communities here. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. You've got five minutes left, including questions. So just oh my goodness. Oh, I'm so Great. sorry. I practiced yesterday and I was done in half an hour, in half an hour and then I sort of started to talk a lot today. Oh, okay. Perfect can, time. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so here are the now 54 communities across the Americas showing distribution of body size and level of sociality. Here is where those communities are located. So he, shown in green and blue is kind of the environmental filter. So what we're doing basically is we do a test if we were to throw spiders randomly in these communities, taking into account this environmental filter, would we see this distribution in space in terms in this sort of this dispersion in terms of in the space of body size and level of sociality for these species? And so here we have in this um 
in this graph the distribution of the random communities and the actual communities are at the tip of this distribution uh, the, uh, the probability that you will observe th that pattern just by chance is, is 0 0.005, basically showing that the, these species are in the, indeed assemble um, are more dissimilar than expected by chance. And so we have shown that there are environmental filters that would explain why and where sp these spiders are social, and that there is niche partitioning and limiting similarity that would explain the composition of their local communities. And I would suggest that these are lessons that we have learned by studying social spiders, but it is likely that these types of resource use and partitioning as a function of uh, level of sociality may be also occurring in other social systems and also potentially in other levels of organization. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody. I am so sorry that I kind of ran over time here. Uh, this has been a team effort in addition to the collaborators in Brazil. These are my students at the University of Arizona, where I was before, University of British Columbia, uh, also students from Ecuador. And I'd also like to thank the wonderful people in those areas where we worked. And just it's been a pleasure basically always to work in Ecuador. And uh, if there is any time for questions, um, I am happy. And I actually, I said I had to leave a little earlier, but I can stay a bit longer to answer questions. So I will stop my share. Yeah, well, thank you very much for your for your talk. It was, I think, a very good example of how you can integrate so many layers um, from behavior to community. Um, very nice example. Thank you very much. And we've got already some questions in the chat. So I will start asking them uh, right now. So the first one that, um, uh, we, we, well, I had, and but also Lucy in the chat had, was about your experiment with the full treatment um, um, with combining rain and predation, depending on the attitude um, with the subsocial species. Uh, so Lucy in the chat was asking, how do you reproduce predation experimentally? So I guess it's about how do you or can you control predation in this system? Yes. And yeah. my question in a very similar term, but how could you control rain <laughs> um, yeah. between yeah. high altitude and the low? Yeah, altitude? so we, we kind of, what we did is basically exclude both of those. And so to, to control rain, we basically just cover them with a tarp that sort of stopped the rain from falling on some of the webs and others were unprotected. And to exclude predators, we put a disc with tangle food, which is a, a substance that's very sticky. So anything that would try to crawl and ants seem to be one of the main predators, they just would st get stuck there. And they so that's at the foot of the plant that contains the web at the top. So th that would stop those predators from getting up there. It wouldn't have prevented flying predators from getting there like wasps. So maybe that's why we didn't see a complete, so we didn't complete completely suppress predators, but at least we suppress those that would sort of crawl up into the webs. And, and we also put these webs far away from branches so that there wouldn't be things falling or jumping in there either. Yeah, good question. Thank you. And we've got a few, uh, a few other questions. What are the major predators of these social spiders, given the, death, the dense web? Uh, I believe most predators would not be very happy to encounter them. So this is a question by Ayush. Yeah, so actually, you know, you would think nobody would be very happy to get there, but there are actually a number of predators. Uh, ants seem to be a big one. They just kind of crawl around and get in there, and sometimes they can raid a colony. There are also these wasps that they come and fly and take one spider out, and, and they know how to do it. So they just go take one spider out, bring it to their nest, and then come back and take another spider. And they usually do this, I've noticed when it's sunny and the spiders are kind of out. And uh, so that would be another one. There's also other spiders like jumping spiders. They are predatory mantises. I think those are actually less likely to do well inside those webs. So that is a good point. But I would say these predatory wasps, they are specialized in capturing web building spiders. Uh, and um, jumping spiders and other spiders. There are also some spiders that still, that actually know how to not be noticed when they are in a web and they kind of 
go they're kind of go inside the webs and they just kind of take 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 the local spider yeah um i i will ask a question i had myself so we've got this very nice study showing um was the partitioning of cultural and subspecies species across the two gradients of across the insect size and the rainfall pressure and um, I was wondering, do you have any idea about whether being social is adaptive or if social and subsocial species were together at the beginning and subsocial species were removed from the LPR region? Sorry, I didn't quite follow what you were asking me. Can, oh, can so you... My question is, is sociality adapted to the condition or was it pre-existent that just the best fit to survive there? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and so where did they start? Where did they come from? So if we look phylogenetically, the vast majority of spiders are solitary. A few have evolved this kind of subsocial behavior, and then the social ones have evolved from those. That's the idea. So I would assume that they would have been first in these areas where they are only subsocial, but then the lowland rainforest would have been an open habitat, and they may have colonized the lowland rainforest by evolving the ability to remain together. So the spiders that disperse before the, the next generation, they become intolerant of each other, and, and then they disperse and leave. So there would have been some sort of mutation that uh, allowed them to tolerate other spiders, and at the same time, suppress the dispersal tendencies. But that would have had to happen in, in, the, in an environment where there was enough food that it was worthwhile to, for them to stay. So it would have been a process of evolution by natural selection taking many generations potentially. Yeah, it's a little bit like when there is a new pathogen colonizing a new host. You know, there are many tries when, you know, they are trying to colonize. And then if after a while with a few mutations that keep happening, eventually they kind of break into the system. So it would have been something, the colonization of the lowland rainforest by living in groups. And then they already, before they become intolerant of each other, they do help each other capture prey in their family group. So they would have already have had that behavior, but they, they had this, this sort of behavior that they repel each other after when they sort of are close to being adults or become adults already. So there would have been mutations that sort of prevented that from happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, I think we will let you there. Um, there are still a few questions, so I don't know if um, you are um, okay to maybe answer them later on Discord or by email if people uh, want yes, to ask further uh, yeah. questions. Yeah, I am so sorry that I kind of ended up talking longer than I had thought I was going to, uh, but I'll be happy to, um, I can see the questions in that um, special it's called platform. Yeah, yeah. There is I will a channel definitely dedicated for your talk and you yes. can put the questions there. Yeah, and also feel free to um, send me an email if you have some pressing question and uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that I cannot see you, but thank you so much for being here. Anybody who watched now or anybody who may be watching in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks so yeah, much well, for inviting me again. Yeah. Thank bye -bye. you very much for, for joining and yeah. have a nice afternoon. Hey, <laughs> yeah. it's 8 a.m. here. Okay. Okay, morning then. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs>